a professor of medicine at the University of California, San Francisco, and I'm chief of the hematology oncology division at the Department of Medicine at San Francisco General Hospital. Uh, I've been working uh, for most of my career in HIV AIDS research, taking care of patients uh, living with HIV and AIDS, and I became interested in uh, looking at marijuana as a possible therapy uh, for patients with the previously frequent uh, AIDS wasting syndrome. As far as people really doing research in marijuana, smoke marijuana, it's very limited uh, to basically the groups that are funded by the Center for Medicinal Cannabis Research in California and uh, Mark Ware and his group in Toronto and maybe a group in New York and Chicago, but it's, it's not anything that people are jumping up and down saying, gee, we want to do this. Again, because a lot of people think that medicine has moved on beyond plants. Now, I myself am a student of uh, botanicals. I have all these herbal compendia there and there, and you know, I'm, I'm doing a fellowship in integrative medicine because I do think that, that plants are medicinal. I mean, I'm a cancer specialist, and many of our chemotherapeutic agents are derived from plants. They're very toxic, they're very effective. Now, as my colleagues say, yeah, but Donald, nobody smokes foxglove. We take digitalis because that's what's been extracted as the active component of the plant, and that's what the pharmaceutical industry has, you know, made their profit out of. But, you know, if you take a more traditional Chinese medicine approach to a plant as medicine, the plant provides both the yin and the yang and the balance and other things that might counter the side effects of the active ingredient. So it's, it's a better thing to use than just the active component. The type of medical marijuana, the quality of medical marijuana, the potency of research grade medical marijuana has been something of a joke. It has all been designed, in fact, to thwart actual research. As such, by thwarting actual research, sincere, straightforward, neutral, scientific method as applies to medical cannabis, by thwarting scientific method, medicine itself has been thwarted, patients have been thwarted. So the only legal source of marijuana for clinical research is the National Institute on Drug Abuse at this time in this country. Uh, all of the marijuana is grown on a farm at the University of Mississippi under the direction of uh, Dr. El Sule, who's been growing marijuana for NIDA for a number of years. It's a pretty much generic marijuana. It's, uh, you know, I believe it's cannabis sativa. It's not indica. And, uh, you know, again, the percent THC that was available in the past the maximum THC content was 3.9%. And we know from studies that were done by Normal and MAPS that uh, cannabis available on the street, the lowest THC content was 8% uh, from a sampling of 47 uh, different buyers clubs uh, with the average 10 to 12%. So, you know, I mentioned to NIDA that it would be good to have higher potency marijuana for our patients to smoke so that number one they could smoke less uh, and number two just because nobody smokes 3.9 percent THC cigarettes so they told me that the problem uh, for them was that seven percent was too sticky uh, to be uh, machine rolled which is how they prepare their cigarettes so somehow they've gotten around that now because now for our vaporizer study we do have 1.7, 3.5 and seven percent THC cigarettes uh, we're comparing smoking them to vaporizing. In modern times, the number of times that a president or a prime minister or some other commission has authorized a review of the medical evidence and the panel that they've empowered to review the medical evidence comes back and said, marijuana is not a dangerous substance. It is a mild intoxicant. It is not a narcotic. It has medicinal benefit. The number of times that this has happened and then that information has been totally ignored is incredible to me. So, you know, the fact that youth, that one could think that in 2004 when we've just elected this administration again, that there is hope that a state of California as individual and as forward-thinking and progressive as we are 
to do something like establish a dispensaries and you know quality control of marijuana distribution I think is is so Camelot and JFK that it you know it makes me yearn for my past as a college student in the 60s but reality based just as I said the number of times that that all of the available literature on marijuana's safety and effectiveness has been reviewed by august government appointed clinic bodies and have come back with the same conclusion that it's safe and it's you know useful and that that information gets ignored i mean we just did it again in 1999 uh, the drugs are retired general barry mccaffrey commissioned the institute of medicine to do the report marijuana as medicine and they also said that cannabinoids have benefit in pain, nausea and vomiting, uh, appetite, and perhaps spasticity. Now a Schedule One substance is one that the government says has no medicinal benefit. Here the government spent a million dollars to commission a report published in a lovely book that says it's beneficial in these four domains and we still say it has no medical benefit. So there's a disconnect here. This is actually like a quantum shift in approach where uh, there will be a state agency that instead of relying upon taxes to fund itself actually can provide a service which is necessary at an affordable rate and do it in such a way as to generate revenues for the state's coffers which they can then be used to either fund other health care or public transit or uh, schools, wherever the state needs to put the money. Any money that's going to come from any legitimate source uh, to give us extra funds in the department for the growth and develop programs that we want to would be, would be welcome with open arms. But I see the biggest value here, again, is that people deserve protection. I mean, people that are consuming marijuana for medical purposes, they really deserve to have the protection of the government to have some standards here so that they're not doing themselves more harm than good while they're trying to treat their illnesses. What I see this as is this is the opportunity where California, due to the way our law is set up and the sovereignty of the state, allows us to set up an agency which could then become either the model for the precursor or actually grow into what would be a national agency as described in the Single Convention Treaty and as part of our Constitution by virtue of being in that treaty. So uh, this gives us a, a unique opportunity, but it kind of gives us a direction that we should be going in, uh, which is fairly similar to what this uh, organization and what this proposal has called for. We desperately need to have everyone be aware of what the boundaries are, what the rules are, what's acceptable and what isn't. The users need to know this, the police certainly need to know this, we as judges seem to know this. A lot of physicians are scared um, to recommend it to, to their patients. Um, for me, it's I'm, I practice medicine, I always have, not because I need to financially, I've done it always because I've liked helping patients. And that's what specifically has drawn me to family medicine. So although this is a controversial area, um, I feel it important to me that if I can improve a patient's um, the way they feel um, or decrease the progression of their disease in some other way that isn't working with tr more traditional medicines that we're trained to use, then I'll go to something such as this when it is legal within the state of California um, and under careful supervision and use this as an appropriate way to treat a patient. The principal problem for me has been um, that uh, when I, when I provide a recommendation for the patient, that is a legal document which makes it legal for them to possess and grow for their medical use. Uh, however, I find that when patients uh, come in contact with the law, that uh, the sheriffs or the courts uh, are not satisfied with this uh, legal document and want more in the way of uh, letters and uh, testimony. Um, I've gotten a number of subpoenas, which have been rather time-consuming um, and totally unnecessary. We've had to cut out a great many of our training programs. We've had to cut out uh, all, almost all out-of-county travel. We've had to trim back on everything, taking all the fat out of the department we can. We've had uh, some hiring freezes, so we've maintained some vacancies and things like that to save those positions. But Mendocino County, the Sheriff's Office in Mendocino County is operating on a, basically a skeleton crew that we have for years. As an example, in 1984, we had 62 deputies. I now have 48. The county population has nearly doubled in that time period. 
So we, what's happened is where we haven't really had the cuts, we haven't.